Please join me in welcoming our television and webcast viewers. My name is Gillian Riley, President-elect of the Canadian Club of Toronto. Viewers, we are very pleased that you are participating with us today. For 120 seasons, the Canadian Club has been proud to provide a forum for leaders and visionaries in every aspect of society to share their ideas with us. We are committed to providing a welcoming venue for discussion and debate on issues that impact our lives. Through our program and activities, we offer access to dynamic political, business, and public figures from around the world. Today's guest speaker is a great example. Before I formally introduce him, here is a preview of some of our upcoming events. Tomorrow, December 13th, we have Ontario Premier Kathleen Wynne, we, she will share her plan to build a stronger province. And on Thursday, January 12th, the Canadian Club will celebrate the 40th edition of its annual political and economic forecast lunch. You won't want to miss it. To order your tickets or to learn more about the club, please visit our website at canadianclub.org. You can also join the conversation via Twitter and Instagram by following us at CDNCLUBTO, Canadian Club TO, or by using that hashtag. I want to express our special thanks to today's event sponsor, RBC Capital Markets. Thank you for your support. Before I introduce today's special guest, let me take a moment to recognize the young leaders who are with us today, sponsored by Maple Leaf Foods. Ryerson Centre for Studies in Food Security, Civic Action Diverse City Fellows, and Food Banks Canada. Could you please stand? Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. And now, our special guest. At this time of year, many of us indulge in sweet and savouring offerings of one kind or another. Yet there are so many who go without the basics, never mind the treats. According to the newly created Maple Leaf Centre for Action on Food Security, the Centre, approximately one-fifth of the world's population is undernourished. Here at home, the statistics are equally disturbing. The Centre claims that over 4 million people suffer from food insecurity. That translates into one in eight households and one in six children. Michael McCain, President and CEO of Maple Leaf Foods, has a plan to reverse those numbers. We are so pleased that he is here to start the conversation through the launch of the Maple Leaf Food Centre for Action on Food Security. The New Brunswick native, has dedicated his entire career to the food industry, which started in the late 70s with senior roles at McCain Foods. He joined Maple Leaf Foods, one of the country's leading food companies, in 1995. Since then, he has been instrumental in transforming the company and the industry. Maple Leaf Foods has more than 11,000 staff and global operations in more than 20 markets and is well respected for its management, philosophy and approach. The President and CEO has lent his action-focused leadership style to key causes, including the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health. He also serves as the Honorary Chairman of the new Centre focused on food security. And I can tell you from just talking with him at lunch, he is very dedicated to this new Centre. Mr. McCain has kindly agreed to take our questions. You will find Q&A cards on the table, so please write out your questions and our volunteers will collect them and deliver them to the podium. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Michael McCain, the Canadian Club podium is now yours. Thank you, uh, Gillian. I really appreciate those kind words and your support in uh, hosting us to talk about a very important topic here this, this afternoon. It's a privilege to be here today to speak to the Canadian Club of Toronto. For almost our entire history, the Canadian Club has been providing a vital forum for people 
to contribute to the national discourse on issues of importance. Your mission to engage Canadians on what matters most is important. You provide an opportunity for people who feel passionately about something to put that idea on the table. And that's what I intend to do here today. My idea is a very simple one. Everybody in Canada should have enough to eat. People in this country, with all our wealth and abundant farmland, should have affordable access to nutritious food. This is the most basic human need. Unemployed, single parent, elderly, disabled, indigenous, working poor, and most especially children should have enough to eat. Right now, that's not the case, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. As a major food company, Maple Leaf has the capacity to make a difference. As part of the Canadian community, we have an obligation to do so. I've been in the food business for over 35 years, building with my family two companies that have literally become Canadian icons in the industry. I consider Maple Leaf to be part of the Canadian fabric in this country with a special responsibility to Canadians. Perhaps it's my upbringing, upbringing down east where the level of economic opportunity has not historically been as robust, where food plays such an important enabling role and is part of the culture, but I personally have this growing discontent with how we have such blessings as a country yet have so many disadvantaged people facing food insecurity. Our focus on this critical social issue really stems from the intersection of where we are as a business and the intractability and worsening of the situation. Maple Leaf has emerged from a difficult decade of massive restructuring and capital investment as a much stronger and more sustainable company. We now have the capacity, the organizational and financial resources to give more back to the country and the communities that have stood by us all these years. The second reason we're so focused on this issue is that the goal of ensuring that every Canadian has the basics of life, stable access to nutritious, affordable and culturally appropriate food is becoming more distant something I find unacceptable in a country as wealthy as ours. The United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization declared that food security exists when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active, and healthy lifestyle. So how many people struggle to get enough food to eat? An estimated 8 million people globally, 8 million, 8 billion, 8, sorry, 800 million. The good news, yeah, that would have been tough. Uh, the good news is that the number has been reduced around the world by 20% over the past 25 years. The bad news is that the number has been declining more slowly than anticipated and is now projected to begin rising again as global population growth outpaces our ability to distribute food efficiently and equitably. Now, of course, you might think all of this is happening in the non-industrial world. Thank goodness you might say, we do not have such problems here in Canada. Well, think again. The really bad news is that while other parts of the world have made progress, in fact, Canada has actually slipped further behind. While it is true that levels of basic deprivation in Canada rarely reach those that exist in other less fortunate parts of the globe, it's an inescapable fact that many Canadians are not able to consistently put enough food, enough good food on the table. Research from the 2014 Proof Report on Household Food Insecurity in Canada reveals that over 12% of Canadians are confronted with food insecurity 
12 percent, forced into either hunger or poor quality food or both. That's four million people, four million, and a staggering one out of every six children. I find that shameful. These individuals are largely concentrated in the lower income groups and are the most vulnerable in our society. Indigenous communities and people on social assistance are most likely to be suffering from food insecurity. In fact, two-thirds of people on social assistance are unable to feed their families adequately. People who have marginal or part-time employment often face food insecurity. Nor is education level a predictor. A recent report by the Ottawa Food Bank shows that fully one quarter of those facing food insecurity have post-secondary educations. Northern Canada represents a unique challenge that combines very high costs of distribution with extreme poverty to create conditions most urban Canadians would deem unimaginable. In Nunavut, in the eastern Arctic, where food costs are up to three times the national average, 60% of the children live in households that are food insecure. 60%. In addition to the human tragedy and basic unfairness of this, there are also practical reasons that we want to reduce food insecurity. Given the impact of a lack of nutrition on learning capacity and productivity, there are some obvious consequences. Food insecurity creates a vicious cycle that ultimately results in wasted potential and people who are not able to make a full contribution to our society. If we wonder why educational outcomes in Indigenous communities lag the rest of Canada, the fact that more of these children are going to school hungry or without proper nutrition is surely a material factor in the answer. Research shows a strong correlation between diet quality and concentration, alertness, and academic performance, including improved test scores, general math and reading scores, and positive social behaviors. Food insecure children are more likely to be suspended from school and have difficulty getting along with their peers. Canada is the only G7 country, the only one, without a national school food program. And the current patchwork of provincial and municipal programs reach only a small percentage of our children. Nor is the sacrificing of human potential the only cost to society. Undernourished people require more health care than well-nourished people. Without adequate nutrition, people are more susceptible to both physical and mental health. And they have less ability to manage chronic illnesses like diabetes through diet. On average, a Canadian dealing with food insecurity will require health services that are up to two and a half times as much as those required by a person with stable access to good food. The total increase in health care costs with food insecurity has been estimated at nearly $8 billion. In Canada, that cost falls on all of us. If we want to get serious about spiraling health care costs, we need to get serious about food insecurity. I think it's obvious that ensuring that all Canadians have this access to nutritious, culturally appropriate food is an important and pressing challenge that we need to solve. It would be good for our economy. It would be good for our society. And we should consider it a moral imperative. So what do we do about this? Answering that question effectively requires first clearly identifying the problem. It certainly isn't that there's not enough food to meet everyone's needs. Canada wastes $31 billion of food annually. 31. 
There are compounding access issues in northern and remote areas. But there's more than enough food produced to eliminate food insecurity if only it was distributed and consumed more efficiently and more equitably. So let's be clear, I'm not advocating for a moment that redirecting food waste to people who are in need is the answer, but the amount of food we waste as a nation magnifies the gap of inequality between people who worry about having enough food and those that have so much that they routinely just throw it out. There are many factors that contribute to a problem of this complexity and this magnitude, but the primary one is income. Statistics Canada found that even with every conceivable contributing factor considered, the central driver of food insecurity is a low income. I quote, the odds that people in low income households would report experiencing food insecurity at least once in the past year were about eight times those for people in upper middle or high income households. Some who lack food security are chronically poor. Some wouldn't normally think of themselves as poor because while money is tight, they're normally able to get by. However, without any financial buffer, any setback, a short-term layoff, an illness, an unexpected bill can make them suddenly unable to put food on the table. Unfortunately, a growing number of people are living on that financial edge. They don't have savings or lines of credit to allow them to smooth a rough patch. It's easy enough for a sudden temporary condition to become chronic when people are that close to the margin. Important as income is, however, it's not the only factor. Optimizing land use, food literacy, access and geography, social isolation, health and mobility all play a role. In 1981, Canada's first food bank opened in Edmonton, Alberta. It was set up as an emergency response to help struggling families cope in a weak economy. Since then, food banks have sprung up in cities and towns across the country. What was intended to be a short-term Band-Aid solution has become entrenched as a safety net in communities coast to coast. Food banks have done marvelous work in this country. They are an admirable response by caring people to support their neighbors. Our company contributes to food banks. But they are not the appropriate or sustainable solution to this problem, and they were never intended to be. Inadequately resourced and reliant on donations, food banks cannot provide families with adequate and healthy diets over extended periods of time. Often they can provide only two to three days worth of food every few weeks, a stopgap at best. Furthermore, only 25 percent, 25 percent of food insecure people in our country will actually access a food bank for reasons ranging from mobility to mental health to the stigmatization and humiliation that unfortunately can coexist with food bank use. But more importantly, this is not a job for private charity. It cannot be in Canada that one's ability to have enough food is dependent on charity. We must find more sustainable solutions and public policies that address the real issues. It's not that governments are inactive on this file. The federal government is moving forward with the development of a national food policy with a mandate, amongst other things, to bring a common focus and direction to increasing food security in Canada and around the world. This is an important policy development that encompasses the interrelated social, environmental, health and commercial aspects of food. We applaud that action and encourage the government to engage all stakeholders, civil society, business, academics and all levels of government 
in a meaningful process. And while this is encouraging, it remains the case that Canada currently lacks a coherent approach, and it lacks the public policy that provides only part of the answers. While food security provides emergency relief, uh, food charity provides emergency relief at best, community organizations that use food as a catalyst to bring people together, to reduce social isolation, to build life and employment skills, to empower people, are nurturing more holistic change in our society. Empowerment starts with treating people who come for assistance with dignity and respect. It goes to the next level when people are provided with opportunities to increase their skills and increase their knowledge. And empowerment goes even further when it results in people coming together to engage in collective efforts and advocate for themselves. Supporting community-based initiatives that are deploying new models to reach people through the power and connectivity of food is fundamental to advancing food security. We also need to break down the silos between governments and across the multitude of community groups and businesses, all grappling with this problem in their own individual ways. We need less polarization, and we need more knowledge transfer so that best practices can be shared and efforts better coordinated. This is easier said than done when people involved are often overworked or volunteering their time and struggling to cope with the basics of meeting a 25% increase in food bank traffic in the past 10 years. They need help and they need resources and they need this on an urgent basis. This is the essence of what we can do. We aren't the experts in public policy, government is. And we aren't experts in how to build the necessary community support systems. The people on the ground are. But we can use our considerable knowledge of the food system, our expertise, and our voice to advocate for change. We can provide funding for new ideas, we can help to disseminate learning, and we can help scale ideas that actually work. In this regard, I'm very excited that we've just launched the Maple Leaf Center for Action on Food Security, a not-for-profit organization. This is a bold and sustained commitment on the part of Maple Leaf to make an impact in this critical social problem. Through advocating to raise awareness, through knowledge sharing and investing in new approaches, the Center will advance the cause of sustainable food security. Our goal, working collaboratively with all of the stakeholders, is to reduce food security insecurity in Canada by 50% by 2030. In view of the fact that our nation has made no progress in the past decade and has actually fallen behind, this is a bold ambition. The only way this goal will be achieved is for everyone involved to contribute their passion, their expertise, and their collective will. Maple Leaf is making a long-term commitment of time, of talent, and of resource to this effort, including an investment expected to exceed $10 million over the next five years, deeply engaging our people to contribute their expertise and volunteer with impact, and continuing to provide product donations to meet immediate needs. Additionally, I'm personally making a contribution of $2.5 million as a first step to establish an endowment fund in support of the Center's efforts. However, this is just the start. <laughs> However, this is just the start, and we're thinking big. So don't be surprised if down the road, I need to reach out to many of you in this room for your support. I love my fundraising work. <laughs> We've assembled a strong board of directors that includes both thought leaders in the food security sector and very committed Maple Leaf leaders. Along with myself, some of our board meter, uh, members are here today and I'd like to ask them if I could to stand in turn. Let me begin with Evan Frazier, 
Director of the Food Institute at the University of Guelph, where he also holds the Canada Research Chair in Global Food Security. Evan? Right. <laughs> Mustafa Koch, one of the founders of Food Secure Canada and the Center for Studies in Food Security Program at Ryerson University. Mustafa? Curtis Frank, who leads Maple Leaf's retail sales organization. Curtis? Rory McAlpin, who heads our government and industry relations effort. Rory? And Linda Kuhn, who is the chair of the center and leads sustainability at Maple Leaf, one of the most remarkable women I've ever had the pleasure of working with. Linda. A Beth Hunter from the McConnell Foundation, who leads their Sustainable Foods Initiative, also serves on the board, but couldn't be with us today. So please join me in applauding our directors for dedicating their expertise and collectively making an impact. The Center will focus its activities in three areas, advocacy, innovation, and learning. Advocacy is a critical component here. This issue needs a bigger profile. In a recent survey of Canadians, 80% were unaware of how severe food insecurity is in this country. 80%. We want to help build that awareness. The Center has launched with a provocative social media awareness campaign, shining a spotlight on the sober reality that over 4 million Canadians who live all around us struggle to feed themselves and their families. The Center will also be highly engaged, as I will personally be, to support an integrated approach to national food policy that ensures all Canadians have the opportunity to eat well, that advances a more sustainable food system, and recognizes the tremendous economic opportunities for our country. While we are not the social policy experts, we know a lot about food, and this is where we will focus our knowledge and our resources. The Centre has established an innovation fund to support alternative approaches from forward-thinking organizations. We're looking forward to their ideas that can be scaled and replicated across the country. We're looking for ideas that build capacity and build self-reliance. We're looking for ideas that advance sustainable change, and here are some examples. The Greater Vancouver Food Bank serves about 27,000 people a week. Like all food banks, it started as a temporary emergency response and grew with demand. Clients often had to line up for hours to receive their allotment, a stressful, humiliating experience with no personal choice to meet their health, family, or cultural needs. The staff at this food bank envisioned a different model, a desire to create a dignified experience, provide nutritious choices, choices, and use food as a bridge to help get people talking, engaging, and accessing other services. While funding from the center, with funding from the center, they are transforming their 11 food banks into community hubs where clients are welcomed by trained staff, treated with dignity, able to choose their food, and benefit from other support services and resources. It's brilliant, and we're proud to be part of this. In the east end of Hamilton, Maple Leaf has established a new prepared meats facility, one of the most advanced in North America. Virtually in our backyard is the community called McQueston. The poverty rate is a staggering 40%, and the child poverty rate is 61%. A few years ago, residents mobilized and developed a neighborhood action plan to improve their community. They identified food insecurity as their most pressing issue. The McQueston community had a vision to create an urban farm from a three-acre vacant parcel of city-owned property situated in the heart of their neighborhood. As of this year, with support from the city and the Hamilton Community Foundation, 
That dream is a reality. The Question Urban Farm began production this past summer with a vision to make healthy food accessible and affordable. Through funding from the center, the farm will be able to extend its production season, establish food markets across the community, and offer skill, skills building and food literacy programs. The Question Urban Farm is breathing new life into the community with food as a powerful catalyst for civic engagement. We are also partnering with FoodShare, one of Canada's leading innovators in food security, to expand their good food markets into a high-needs, underserved community right here in the GTA, the Westmont Mount Dennis area. Good food markets are community markets that sell high-quality, culturally appropriate, low-cost fruits and vegetables. Getting healthy food into low-income areas where walkable grocery stores just don't exist is the priority. These markets tend to create a certain kind of energy in the neighborhood as well. You can get a lot more from a market than just food. FoodShare has been around for a long time and achieved remarkable outcomes. But what they have never been able to do is to implement an intensive, scaled expansion of these markets and their community development model in a high-needs area. With our support, they will also be able to measure the impact of this concerted neighborhood-level intervention to increase food access, improve health, and support community capacity building. We're very excited about these and future partnerships. As with any innovation, some will be successful, while others may not be. Which takes me to the third focus of the Centre, the Learning Hub. We want to learn what works and what doesn't, and share what we discover. We want to facilitate the transfer of that knowledge and collective efforts across the many people and the many organizations working in this sector. Resources for this challenge are too scarce not to be putting, uh, putting them where they can do the most good. We will support collaboration and networking that enables groups and communities to increase their output and their impact. And we will support research that provides vital insights to deepen the collective body of knowledge. So in closing, thank you for hearing me today on this topic. It's complex, it's frustrating and disheartening, but it's also timely. Many of us are looking at the political events that are unfolding south of us, and it should cause us to reflect on our own national values and how we intend to build a society of inclusiveness. Canadian values have always, they've always been rooted in compassion, in equal access, and opportunity in meeting basic human needs. We've engineered progressive structures in our society, everything from universal education and health care to interprovincial equalization, in order to ensure that every individual in our country has a chance to fulfill their potential and live a life of dignity. And for those that fall from time to time, we have sought to establish a safety net that ensures the fall isn't too hard and you can get back up. That's what Canada is to all of us. It's in this spirit that I know Canadians will join the battle for universal food security in this country if they knew the scale of this problem and they knew that we could fix it. I know with all my heart and conviction they'd be right there with us. If people are undernourished, they hardly have an equal opportunity to lead healthy and productive lives. It's my hope that you will tell others about this issue support those that confront food insecurity in whatever way you can, and help us create a more just society, a Canada where no one gets left behind. Thank you. Before we go to the uh, formal thank you, we do have a couple questions from the floor. So uh, the first one is, you said that your goal was to reduce uh, the food insecurity in Canada by 50% by 2030. 
How will you measure success in reaching this goal? Uh, that's a great question, and uh, you know, fortunately, we have the benefit of you know, a societally accepted definition of food security. Uh, the statistics are reported by StatsCan. We know today that there are 4 million Canadians uh, that are food insecure today, and we can measure our progress of a 50 percent reduction based on that publicly available data. So uh, I think what, what differentiates this initiative is that we are goal-driven. We're not we, — we, there are a lot of great things that are done for big problems in our society. I think what differentiates the work that this team is, has uh, put behind this effort is that we have established a very large, significant goal for a 50 percent reduction by 2030, and it is measurable, and we'll know the progress along the way. Wow, that's great. Now, um, the center, will you be expanding to global initiatives? Uh, we, expect, uh, we expect some both learning and engagement from a global, on a global basis, but in the near term, our, our focus of effort is right in our backyard. We think that's the right focus today. There will be, over time, as I said, some connectivity and engagement with various, uh, various uh, organizations that are working on the global scale of this, of this problem, organizations like UNICEF. Uh, but uh, our focus of effort, for the most part, is going to be in our backyard and the 4 million Canadians that are suffering from food secure insecurity today. Well, I applaud you on the bold goals and what you're doing in our own backyard. Final question for you is, how will you be expanding to other Canadian cities? Now, I think you mentioned Vancouver and you yeah, mentioned this Toronto. Yeah, this is very much a national effort. Uh, it isn't a Toronto-based effort. We are — we expect to uh, — we expect uh, to uh, be involved in any innovative project that meets the criteria that I laid out across the country. Uh, this problem is a national problem, and certainly uh, it's relatively obvious that we have to connect to the, to the issues of the North at the same time, because the intensity of that issue in, in, our, in the northern part of our country is, you know, just, uh, you know, incredibly shameful for all of the country. So it is a national effort. It's not just here in Toronto. We have projects uh, — we have a project in Hamilton, one here in the GTA, and one in Vancouver to start, but we expect, you know, multiple projects every year across the country. Well, thank you. Your passion is clearly very evident for this initiative. I'm going to invite Philip Tardif, a fellow Canadian Club director, to do the, the formal thank you. So thank you. So, Michael, on behalf of the Canadian Club of Toronto, I'd like to thank you for your leadership on a topic that uh, affects all of us, uh, food insecurity. We're pleased that you've uh, chosen our podium here at the Canadian Club to shed light on a sobering reality that not only directly affects 4 million Canadians, but impacts all of us. You're right, it's time to shine light on this national issue. It's time for Canadians to come together and decisively address food insecurity. With the creation of the Centre, you've taken an important step in helping us work together to raise the profile of the issue and to address the issue once and for all. Let's begin now. Information about the Centre. Uh, is available on your tables here on this uh, black card, so please take note, please take them home and, and uh, follow the links. Michael, we admire your commitment and leadership to the food industry, and thank you again for sharing your insights today. Uh, this concludes our program for today, which will be broadcast on Rogers TV in the days to come. We are grateful to Rogers TV and 680 News for their continuing promotion of Canadian Club events. We would also very much like to thank RBC Capital Markets for your generous support and as our sponsor for today. We would also finally like to thank MediaEvents.ca, Canada's online event space, and VVC for live streaming today's event. And I must say this was a tremendous event. It was a great cause, and right before Christmas, it seems very timely, and we wish you all the success with your center, and I'm sure you're going to have a multitude of success and reach your goal by the year 2030. This concludes our program today, and we will see you again at the next event, which is tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>